go live on Instagram. And for some reason, the going live is okay. The going live is going live. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome to Fran and Friends. It's Sunday. You guys already know. it. Th today is the Game of Parenting and How to Play It, part three of 10. And I have this wonderful human being with me, Dima Istanbuli. <laughs> so today's topic, <laughs> today's topic is kids' behaviors. Where do they stem from? Is it nature, nurture, or what? <laughs> yeah, and I think it's it's the topic that in psychology there's always this debate around these two. But first, let let me remind everyone of the older episodes we had. So when we came up with this idea, it was always based on our stories, how we started as parents, and what we learned. However, we wanted to make this information accessible to everyone. So we thought, why not talk about relationship with, with our kids? And based on that episode, when we talked about what we should do, what we shouldn't do, how we can improve those relationships, we discovered together um, how to, we discovered the importance of self-compassion mm -hmm. in building those healthy relationships. And last time when we talked, we were so focused on self-compassion and on our childhood experiences, how they affected us. But again, we discovered that a lot of parents have habits that they need to change. And they find that sometimes it's hard to change not even their habits because the, the main focus of parents is usually how can I remove the pain I'm having because of the behavior of my children? Mm. And what we talked about as well was how our children's behavior is a reflection of our attitude as parents. <laughs> Which brings us to today to talk about where do our behavior and the behavior of our children, the personalities of our children, how do they develop? Um, and that's why we want to dig deep into the topic of nurture or nature. Mm -hmm. And as simply as that, it is a mix of nature and nurture, and we're gonna talk to, talk about it. But first, I think it would be nice to tell us a friend about your experience as a parent. So just to, to remind people about your story, why you invited me first on this podcast, and everything about you. <laughs> okay, no problem. So I invited you. You already know I love that how we connected on LinkedIn, um, talking about our experiences as parents. And I thought, well, since I'm having this podcast, I felt like your story was really relevant to other parents out there that needed uh, some therapy for themselves. And I thought, what better way to have this conversation than have Dima on because um, some people can't afford therapy. And so I thought that would be perfect to give them a resource that they can tap into immediately without having to come out of pocket, paying like a therapist, like a hundred and something dollars an hour or even more. And so like your book, Sometimes you offer it for free, but it's only $30. And I'm sure we spend that on like fast food all the time. So I thought it'd be perfect. So that was the reason why I wanted you to come on the podcast was to share with other parents just an opportunity to work on themselves so they can be a better version of themselves for their children. Not just that, but it'll also impact them in a way that they are not going to recognize until they do the work. So. Yes. And what about, what about, can you hear me? So my book, can you hear me? <laughs> right there. <laughs> I wrote that because I grew up, since we're talking about nature and nurture, um, I felt like that I was nurtured in a way where my parents weren't given the skills or the tool sets or weren't taught the correct tool sets to 
teach communication because that was nothing that I experienced in a healthy way. A lot of the times in the house that I grew up in, we argued a lot. I saw hitting a lot. I saw nonverbal communication. I saw unhealthy communication. And I passed some of that stuff on to my children. But one day I woke up and I realized that I don't want to do this anymore. And so I, at a pivotal point, I realized once, what should I say pivotal? I realized that this behavior needs to stop somewhere. And what I already currently know isn't working for me. And so now I needed to shift into a different space in order for me to get something different. I needed new knowledge. So if it wasn't for my daughter, sassing her mouth off at me, <laughs> causing me <laughs> to look at myself, <laughs> I probably would not be here having this conversation. <laughs> So that event between me and her where I told her to take the trash out and she turned around and told me, you take the trash out because you're not doing anything that set my mind off. In addition to that, my boyfriend at the time or my partner at the time, he had great communication skills with him and his family. And that was something that I thought that I could really use. And so I asked him to really help me and teach me how to do that. And so because of those two events, this is how the book came about. That's where I learned the beginning of communication, healthy communication. <laughs> yeah. You know, I want, like, it's nice because now I have an idea. You started because of a parenting struggle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I started because of a personal struggle. And that's what I want today to highlight um, to the people that are listening to us, especially working parents, especially people that are so ambitious, they want to do everything, they want to be perfect at everything, but feel that they burned out. And that's where I was 10 years ago, around the mark of 10 years ago, where I was an architect, successful at everything I do, at home, I'm successful as a mother. However, I wasn't fulfilled. Whatever money I made, I wasn't fulfilled. There was mm -hmm. something always keeping me not in peace, not happy. So, and I hit rock bottom somehow because me known for my smile and everyone knows my smile. Suddenly, whenever so someone asks me, how are you? I'm like, uh, and my tears start falling. And here, I couldn't understand what's going on because nothing is missing in my life. And I went into this um, journey of discovery. Based on that journey, I was, I was feeling pain and I wanted help when I asked for help. And this is going back to what you shared. When I asked for help, it was always people asking me to hop on a, on a discovery call 15 minutes later, I'm crying. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, the time is up. You need to register for the program. You need to pay $5,000, $10,000, whatever it is. I know and I understand, and I'm not underestimating the, the, the job people do, but there was a need for me at that time when I didn't have the money, I didn't have the resources, neither right. the time to invest in helping myself out. Um, I, was, I was lost. And I really needed help and I couldn't find it. And this is where it all started for me. I wanted, like I thought, is it fair if someone doesn't have money um, to, to be stuck? And that, and we all know what stuckness could do. Mental stuckness could lead to suicide, to self-harm, to so many uh, epidemics we have in our society today with the mental health crisis going like, I can remember when they used to talk about the curve of the pandemic of COVID-19. We have a silent pandemic hitting the world, especially the youth. So mm -hmm. fast forward, I opened my Instagram account. I started sharing my pain. It wasn't that I was sharing my expertise and everyone started asking for help. And I'm like, what? I'm crying. How could I help? And by helping others, I was able to heal myself. However, 
I started looking and seeing a pattern that most of the people I had, although I'm an architect and not a psychologist, um, at that time, uh, I haven't, like now I started my degree in psychology, but during the past few years, I discovered that, that passion for, for psychology, but I was giving advice that was really simple, and people just from a simple chat were able to solve their own issues. Wow. And the, the origin of their problems were from their childhood most of the time, and that was the pattern that I saw. And I was like, okay, this is where COVID hit, and I'm like, okay, I'm solving all these issues. Maybe if COVID comes and hits me, maybe I'll, I'll disappear from this life. So why not put all my knowledge in a book? And that's why, like, intentional reset. Yes, I give it for free. Most of the time, if someone reaches out and asks me for it, I give it for free because at one point in my life, I wanted that unconditional support and I didn't have it. And when I wrote it, I wrote it with this intention that, I want to give a document for people who are struggling in silence so that they can improve their life. Mm. So based on that, today we're here to say, no matter what the problem you're dealing with it, whether it's a parenting like friends issue started mm -hmm. or a professional problem or a personal problem like feeling not fulfilled and unhappy, no matter what it is, there is an underlying factor and most of the time it is from childhood but also there is the role of genes in the way we feel about ourselves wow wow so <laughs> I, yeah i was thinking about like um what is that one called is that one called na nature right nature is the one where we're affected with the biology correct Yes, yeah, it could be biology and it could be um, like it could be biology from our parents' genes or it could be biology from a problem in our uh, transmitters, neurotransmitters. Mm. Yeah, but th this is normally like the neurotransmitters thing, as I recall from research, they say it's 5% of people that might be affected by that. Mm. However, genes, I'll talk briefly about genes because we're not doctors, but what I learned in my psychology degree is our nature affects our fulfillment and happiness in a coefficient that is 50%, which means if we want to talk about happiness and how does happiness come, not behavior, we're going to look at three different characteristics. Okay. One is the genes, two is the circumstances, and three is intentional activity, mm. okay? Our genes are responsible for 50% of our happiness because they provide us the way we, the way we, like whatever uh, genes we have from our parents, give us a certain baseline for, for happiness. Okay. Okay. Our circumstances, our jobs, the money, the, everything we have accounts for 10% only of our happiness because we are human beings and we tend to have adaptation. So to give a quick example, you want your dream car and you can like really think of anything except of that car. You get the car, you drive it for one, two weeks, three weeks, and then suddenly, you forget about it. You forget that it's a new car and it becomes an old car. And maybe if you're too successful, you start thinking about your own jet or your own boat or your own. So we have this adaptation that let us lose the moment and mm -hmm. seek something else. Mm. The third one is intentional activity, which is everything we do for our own happiness like exercise going out the things that fulfill us if we do them regularly like a gratitude journal mm -hmm. like um, focusing on our strengths so this is quickly just trying to to give an idea how genes are responsible for a certain base in our life 
that we go back to whatever we're doing. Okay. Okay, so but one thing we need to really emphasize on, the power of nurture in the nature. So we have a nature, right? Mm -hmm. However, our minds um, and like brains are, are flexible. And that's epigenetics. That's when they tell us that the environment, although we have a certain biology that affects our genes, our, our genes are adaptable as well to the environment. And that's how, even though we have a baseline, regularly changing our behavior will get us to have a new behavior. And that's the power of nurture. Because I was thinking like, you always hear these stories of people that come from backgrounds like poverty, poverty backgrounds. And yeah. because they have positioned themselves in a way where either they've gone to school or whatever work that they've done to increase their knowledge base, they no longer are affected by where they came from because they've shifted themselves into a new space. Yes. And, and let's, let's give, I always like to give examples. So whoever is listening to us today will take something out of our conversation. So mm -hmm. imagine our mobile phones. Mm -hmm. When we buy our mobile phones, we already have applications, yeah? So we have the mobile phone and we have the touch screen on the phone. Okay. Because we have applications, we are able to use the touch screen, right? Yes. Who put these applications? The manufacturer. Now, as a baby, we are born with a structure. It is a structure. The phone is a structure. Okay. We cannot change the structure. However, our parents, and we'll talk in a bit about the details of how things happen, but our parents start downloading applications that we might need in life. Mm. And we can't use the application, we cannot use the touch screen, except after a certain amount of time, after mm -hmm. this information is, is downloaded. So this is us as a human being. We, we are born in our programs as a blank state. Right. The blank state has a new programs installed by our parents. We learn from our parents, from our environments, from our role models, whether they are education teachers, whether the priest at church, any religious figure. And when we put it in action, with time it becomes our own and we start adding new applications to our phones. So it's the, so here we are as a blank slate, our parents or, and the people that are around us are the influences of what we now adapt as our own beliefs. Yes. So whether, whether the parent has given, downloaded that in a state of survival or whether it was healthy, those are things yes. that they inputted in us or downloaded to us for, I guess, preparation of life. Yes, and this would lead to either having a, a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. Mm. So imagine us as parents, when we look at our kids and we see them struggling, before we attempt to change that struggle or to remove that struggle, when you go back to the information we're sharing with you now, you're gonna stop and think, oh, what did I do when my child was younger that affected the way they are looking at life? And then when I really understand it, then I will be able to say, you know what? This is not working. And the only way you can change for your children is by changing yourself. And we talk about it in detail. I love it. I love it. Let's go. <laughs> so, so if I like all the information I have is based on books, research, but we all have this uh, margin of, of information that might be a bit not very, very specific. So we're not doctors, we're not uh, uh, psychologists yet, but this we can use this information as guidelines so we can understand. And if we feel, if someone feels that they are really interested in this, I invite them to go and research more, yeah? Yeah. So yeah. in lifespan development, they divide life, uh, the, the life of individuals into many parts, yeah? 
We're not yeah. going to go into the micro uh, micro stages because you have zero to two, two to five. Like the, we're not going to go into this. We're going to go roughly into three stages of development for young people. Yeah. Okay. The first one is from zero to seven, roughly. Yeah, those are supposed and to be the primary ages, right? And yes, and this is the stage where at the very beginning. I want to use the, the biology as well. So our brain is in a theta uh, state, which theta. means the, theta, theta, T H E. Yeah. Yeah. Theta. So theta. during <laughs> during that stage, whatever they hear, whatever they come across with, is going to go into their mind without any resistance. Mm. So that's the subconscious uh, collection. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and I'm mentioning the wave state because later on we're going to say how we can change it based okay. on that information. So when the brain is in that position, it doesn't resist. It just everything goes in. So whatever we see our parents doing, which, like, please listen carefully. If you're smoking and you come to your teenage saying you're not allowed to smoke and you've been smoking since they were babies. For them, from zero to seven, the program, the divine program is, ah, oh, smoking is good. <laughs> if you are an angry person and you've been shouting all the time, you've been angry, you don't have self-control. And you are, I understand that you might be busy. I understand that life could be unfair sometimes. But during that stage, if you were that person, later on, that's the program of your children. So when we talk zero to seven, it's really a foundational period where our kids need us. Mm. Need they the need our attention. Wow. And they, they need, need our intentional <laughs> program. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. So whatever <laughs> we've done during that period is a program. And here, please, again, whoever is, is watching today, don't judge yourself. It's information. Today you knew about it. So you're not don't look back and say, ah, oh, I was an idiot. Because the parent <laughs> During school years, when we start with year one, yeah, it's very hard. Our math tests are very hard. We go through it trying to learn, and it's sometimes very hard. Now, when we're talking now, we're in year 12 of that year of school. If you look back at yourself 20 years ago and you say, oh, my God, I was an idiot, means you're looking at the year one student and saying, how the hell they don't know how to solve this math exam? That's an unfair comparison. Exactly. So like yeah. in life, a lot of people, like yesterday I was with someone and that parent said, but I can't believe like there were a lot of red flags and I could, could, couldn't pick them up. I was stupid. I'm like, no, you're not stupid. Because at that specific time, as a parent, we did what we knew best, and most of the time we were imitating the programs that were installed by our parents. Absolutely. Yeah, we can't behave in a way that we don't know how to emulate. If we can't, if we don't have that information, we can't model it. Exactly. And we can't really look back and say, oh my God, I did this and I've done that. What you can do is listen to what we're talking about and try to understand how you can move forward. And even if your kids are really old, you can still make a difference. And we're gonna talk about it later, okay? Right. So the zero to seven is really an important stage in the development of our children, right? At seven, they have the touch screen. Now they can operate their own program. But before I continue, I don't know if you've heard the G Jesuits Jesuits brothers who say, give me a child before the age of seven and I will deliver a man. Uh -huh. 
okay so that that they use it they use it to tell you that before seven if you give the right tool to your children you can develop of them legends mm, wow even in islam if i i i was on a i have a radio show with a lady uh, who's muslim she was telling me that in the quran as well they have something called uh, they have a rule related to the number seven seven years of age and mm. they say the first seven the second seven and the third seven and that's what we roughly all of us talk about development of human beings goes through stages so stages one stage one is zero to seven stage okay. two seven to 12 13 yeah okay during that, during that stage i have my mobile phone now i have my programs and i start playing with the program at the start when i'm alone it's it's a bit hard so you can't you start seeing kids struggling with their identity they want to do things but they can't do them you're always there to help them but mm -hmm. again how we're helping them we're helping them install and get used to our programs mm -hmm. whether they are good or bad okay okay so during that time they develop their identity and here we have two, two types, maybe more types, but I'm gonna take the extreme. You have the parent that gives the person the liberty to change a bit in the way that, in the way they use the application. And you have parents that are gonna stand there, look at the child and make sure they follow the instruction step by step. <laughs> which is the micromanaging <laughs> i was like uh yeah i, I, I probably operated in that <laughs> yes and which leads us to teenagers teenage mm -hmm. years that or again we see the student or the child who is happy peaceful um you put them somewhere and they find solutions mm. or you have the child who's anxious, doesn't know what to do. They want the opinion of their parents all the time. So at 12, 13, they take the program. They want to implement it in their lives. And if it was a good program, we already have a good base for our children. And wherever we put them, they're going to be able to resist temptation. Or we have children who have been suppressed for so long either they want to conform fully or they want to rebel and they go to their peers and try to ask for advice they stop talking to their parents for two reasons the biological biological reason is because their hormones are changing and this is a hard time for them mm -hmm. but at the same time it's looking at their parents and saying you know what i don't want this in my life i want something right it's the validation right because they're not they didn't get it properly yes yeah. and and like again i every day because i we're not here to advertise any services but based on my work i deal a lot with with students and teenagers and in a program called ceo for a day so for me it's not about therapy i try to tell kids who are disengaged, that nothing is wrong with you. Come on, let's see how you can be a successful person in life. Yeah? So yesterday right. I was in yeah. one of these programs and the person who was talking to me is 16. And we were talking about something that his mother wants him to do. And I said, okay, do you agree with that? He said, no, I don't want to do that. I like, did you say to your mom that you don't want to do that? I said, no, 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 I'm too scared. No, 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 she, no, no, like he couldn't even continue the idea. And I was convincing him that it's not, you're not impolite if you give your opinion. You just introduce mom to your new, to your new, to, to your way of thinking, your actual way of thinking. He said, I'm going to try, but I promise you, I'm too afraid to tell my mom some, something like that. Mm. 
So, <laughs> no, in my opinion, I encourage kids, even if their parents are going to be mad, it's mm -hmm. better to start testing the testing the the limits. But it would be much yeah. beneficial if I can talk to the parents and say, "Come on, let's sit together," and and that's what I normally do because some of the students come from like some of the programs are paid by parents and some of the programs are paid by schools okay so when they're paid with their parents i sit with the parent later on and we do like a deep briefing of the session and instead of saying that the child is afraid and cannot operate because a lot of parents see it as a, as if a kid is really um telling on them oh got you got you because again, we go back to last week episode when we talked about self-compassion because they lack the self-compassion. They get offended by whatever they're, they're listening to and they cannot change. So the whole point is we really make a big influence on the way our kids think. Yeah. We either want them to look up to us and come to us with any problem they have and say, mom, dad, I don't like this, or I like this, or I did this with my friends, I'm not happy, but I wish to do it in a better way. If you are a parent who is micromanaging, who's super controlling, instead of building a relationship, and I know we do this sometimes, because we want to save them from the trouble we went through, but I think it's a recipe of disaster. Somehow. Yeah, I think it goes back to that idea that I was talking about last week where, or the week before where, when we don't give our kids that space to have that, that conversation on where they're at. Um, and you mentioned very specifically, what is that? Them pushing the boundaries. So if they're suppressed, in sharing their ideas at home with parents and family that they're supposed to be safe with, they then go out into the world and also suppress their ideas and their boundaries in those other spaces as well. So that's really why we want to bring that up is because we would like for children to walk out of their homes more secure in who they are so that when they are faced with these kind of challenges or they do have these kind of conversations that they won't be swayed to the left or to the right because they are, will already have that foundation at home because they know uh, what to compare their values with and whether or not they want to continue to participate in that thing that's being presented to them. One million per percent, and another disadvantage, and this convinces a lot of people to change, is the system you use at home to teach your parents about life is the system they're going to accept from life to teach them. Example of that, if I want to find a park, and at home, I don't have the luxury to give my opinion. I'm told what to do. And a lot of times my parents lose self-control and they disrespect me without mm. knowing. Mm. The first person I'm going to meet to satisfy these credentials Ooh. Ooh. is going to be my comfort zone. Oh, my gosh. Parents, do you hear that? So if we have children that find safety in someone outside of the home, that thing could be volatile. They could be running into to the arms of someone that is physically, mentally, verbally abusing them. So creating safety at home and conversation and having conversations that you may not like because of the topic uh should just be conversations and not something to be not something to fight against yes and this brings us to the idea of authority and parenthood 
And I've seen so many people saying it's all about authority. You cannot deem, and they will tell me, you cannot treat your kids as friends. You cannot treat your kids as equals. Yeah, I used to believe and, that. And here I debate that idea because the only way a person would share the truth is when they're talking to a friend or to a business partner, let's say, mm -hmm. if I want to, to someone who they feel close with. They wouldn't go to the police and tell the police the truth if they've done something wrong. However, I have a story around that. There was a girl in the school I was helping and they found a knife with her. She was, you know, kids take risky behaviors. Okay. Yeah. And then when they are, like when everyone is pointing at them, they develop that lie more and more and more and more. So I sat with that girl and I started talking to her and telling her, listen, the shortest way out is the truth. Mm. Okay. You're afraid of the punishment, but you're making your punishment even worse. Now we developed that relationship and I promise you it was only in 15 minutes. Yeah, and she wanted me to be present with her parents because she was afraid to share the truth. But because I built that connection as a full stranger and I was new in the school, she was able to say the truth, say who gave her this, what she did, and she was able to get less punishment than if she was going through the one lie after another. So wow. this same girl, when you look at the way she acts with her mom, I'm looking at them and I see that the girl is trusting me more than her mom and she's 16. Mm. Like, isn't that a sign for many parents that it's time for us not to think of our own ego, how, how what can we impose on our children solutions and um, problem solving. And we don't have to do it for them. We need to take the lead and be the role model that they will follow to find solutions themselves. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Dima, like, how do parents find themselves in that kind of situation to where um, it was perfect. You are a complete stranger. And yet her mom is there. That's telling you that the conversation at home, she can't have a safe conversation. It's already without even it being said verbally, the action there, you already see that there's some type of disconnection in the communication. Friend, so many people are on uh autopilot and maybe that would be a good thing to talk about mm -hmm. now because this will give us and give people an idea about okay we're here we've been doing this and sometimes we're not aware that we're doing this how can we change it but originally how does it happen like our reaction right how so we're, not, we're not aware we're not of aware of our, our, own, our own programmings we're not aware of our own programs programming and going back we said zero to seven seven to twelve twelve to eighteen eighteen through life yeah mm. let's talk about language we started as babies we never knew language mm -hmm. and at the start we either learned phonetics we learned um, letters we learned how to link them together it took us a long time to read write and speak fluently okay yeah. yeah, but now as we're talking, I don't think about what I'm talking about. Why? Because it's automatic. Okay, because we've already went okay. through the training. Yes, and that applies to everything in life. Even our reactions, a lot of times we do things exactly like our parents. And when someone says, oh my God, you are acting exactly like your parents. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not. Why? Because I'm not aware. <laughs> now, why I'm not aware? Let's go back. To the programming in a i'll put it in a fun way and i'm sure a lot of you have heard about it before but let's talk about how our mind and brain are connected and how our behavior really um develops okay 
okay? So let's talk about the brain first. The brain is in charge of all our actions. So whatever our body does, the brain is in charge of. Let's say it's, a ve it's very hot outside. We go out, our skin takes like sends signals to the brain saying it's very hot, we need to cool down in a, in a way. Okay. The brain gives an order to the nervous system to sweat. So the nervous system sends to all the organs and that's how we sweat. As simple as that, this is how the brain works. It takes something from the environment and it acts on it automatically. Now, as a human beings, because that first system is everywhere, for animals it's the same. As human beings, we have the mind before the brain. So the mind interprets things before it arrives to the brain. So our interpretation style, okay. let's say we are in an accident, yeah? Before the brain um, acts, either cry, laughs, cools down, the, the mind needs to have an interpretation. So if I'm in an accident or if I have an illness, the first thing my mind will be either it's like a fear, what's going to happen to me, I might die, what's gonna, what can I do with my family, or a perspective of love and hope. Okay, let me take things slowly try to process what's going on, understand what's happening to my body, see how I can fight this illness, okay? Now, if it's a fear, let's talk about the love and hope because it's easier. If okay. it's love and hope, my mind is gonna send an order to the brain saying, it's fine, it's cool, let's find solutions. So it gives it, it broadens its view. So the, the, the brain is gonna cool down, looks in the repertoire of my, my, my structure about previous events, what did I do, how can I build that resin, right? Okay, so now, it's looking for a frame of reference. Yes, and okay. biologically, my dopamine levels goes up, my serotonin go up, everything good for my body goes up. Okay. And my immunity is not affected because I still have my energy that could sustain my immunity. Now, the second part, the second scenario is when my mind chooses the fear and the worst case scenario. So the first thing that happens to my brain is that it narrows. It goes towards, we've heard it, fight, flight, or freeze. So if it's fight, means I need to use my hands. So all my energy, all my blood flow narrows down to my hands so I can fight as hard as I can. If it's flight, it goes to my legs and I start running and running and running just to, 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 to win, just to escape the danger, mm -hmm. okay? So when my mind narrows down, my whole energy is going towards one area and my cortisol levels are up. Mm. What does it mean that cortisol levels are up? Side note, when someone wants to do a heart transplant, the body doesn't accept new organs. So what they do, they use cortisol they give you, they high, like they, they give you, I think, um, injections of cortisol so your body immune system switches off so that you can accept the heart, get the heart working, and then they reduce the cortisol so your body accepts the heart step by step. So the cortisol stops the immune system from fighting. So now, it's an artificial, like, immunity? Yes, it's an artificial. They, you lose immunity. They put you in a place where you cannot attract any viruses. While they, while they did the transplant, they keep you maybe two weeks until your body accepts the new organ, and bit by bit they reduce the cortisol, so your immune system goes up again. Okay. Now, imagine 
when we have a perspective of fear, all what we're doing is the cortisol is up, immunity is off, and this is what is the reaction of our, our uh, brain, is to send the body and say, cry, say, uh, get depressed, anxiety, and the more we think of the negative, the more negative we will attract, and we will be at the same wavelength as all the negatives. So imagine our interpretation, our explanatory style could predict how we're going to live our life. Wow. The, so the flight, the fight, the flight, and the freeze, those are our responses that we learn um, as far as how to react uh, to different scenarios in our life. If we haven't learned a specific, like, I guess, way to react or a healthy way to react, or those are just um, immediate re responses to, I guess, reactions coping. to. Yeah, they're coping strategies. Cope, yes, they, coping strategies. They, they are a defense, meta, defense meta, me mechanism. That's what inside I'm our defense mechanism. Yes, it's yes. a defense mechanism in a negative way. So they are trying to protect us, but in fact, we we'll, it's it's an automatic reaction. It's not a reaction we chose. It's a reaction based on our survival mode because our body wants to fight. So here the question is: okay, then the mind has two interpretation styles. And if the negative one is bad, why don't we all choose the positive one and we finish and we're all happy? <laughs> because we haven't learned how to do that yet <laughs> exactly because our mind and this is the the fun part about this like it's all by the way in my book i wrote it out of knowledge just like even like i learned it from so many ways and i combined them together and they really make so much sense and now while i'm studying psychology it's it's very similar like it's the same information <laughs> so what is the mind then? How can we change the structure of the mind in order for us to choose our responses, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, what is the brain? The mind, sorry. The mind, we have a conscious mind and we have a subconscious mind. So from zero to seven, we were in theta frequency. From seven to 12, we were in which frequency? Are we still in theta? No, there? no, no, because we are on a higher level or lower level, depends, and okay. we are assimilating information. So yes. during the theta, we have access to our subconscious mind and we are filling the subconscious mind with information. Okay. Okay. Now, the mind, this. The structure of the mind, the subconscious structure of the mind is 95% of our days. Because we learn, we, we eat, we talk, we walk. Everything we do, we do now is automatic. Because of habit repetition, habit repetition, we developed a, a, a reservoir of information and reactions. Memory, we don't want to go into real psychology like Freud what does Freud says no, you know I was, no I was thinking like if this if the area from zero to seven is that impactful where it is 95 percent of our responses what are we doing <laughs> yeah that's that's feeding the 95 percent because it starts zero to seven then seven to twelve we are repeating so we're still proceeding Mm -hmm. 12 to 18, if the environment is still the same and we are exposed to the same, it's we're still empowering that 95%. Now, mm -hmm. it could be a good thing. So if we are we have a positive way of thinking, then our subconscious is 95% positive and our reaction, and here I'll talk about the reaction. So the conscious mind is only 5%. So when you dream about what you're going to achieve, when you dream about your business, your job, your future, your marriage, all the things you dream of are only 5%. Wow. Because they're new. If you, wanted, if you don't know how to drive today, you really want to drive, it's now and only in the 5%, it's a dream. You go behind the wheel, you get an instructor with you, you start practicing. First, you have to know the rules of the road. 
-hmm. Second, you need to start practice with someone next to you in a place that doesn't have a lot of people. The third step is you start driving bit by bit, and then now all of us, we drive without thinking. That's exactly behavior. So your conscious mind is we're putting a seed, but that seed, if we don't unpluck the weed, mm. where, it's gonna, where it's gonna grow. And the most important information is that the subconscious is one million times faster than your conscious mind. So if your conscious mind... That is so crazy. <laughs> it's a million so times faster than our conscious mind. I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, if we're comparing 90, 95% to 5%, that makes sense. <laughs> yes. And like if you, let's say if you're consciously thinking, uh, planning something new, we have around 40 idea per second that jumps into our head. Wow. The subconscious is 40 million ideas per second. So that's why Oof. we are faced with illness, right? The two that's scenarios work like this. What? That's why we're what, Dima? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you because. You know how, we, how I gave the example of illness. We are faced okay, with an okay, illness, illness, right? Okay. When I think of illness, I think of my parents, I think of my grandparents, of my neighbor, of all the people who had this illness, whether it's cancer or whatever the illness is, my, my information comes from the subconscious system that is knowledge, experiences, um, childhood experiences, anything that happened with us, has, we stored certain reactions, stored certain reactions until it happens. Now, if the information is based on your subconscious mind, so if your subconscious mind has stored the information in a way, illness is bad, it's dangerous, people are dying, they will die, then automatically, one million, per, one million faster, you're gonna go towards the bad idea, and your right. cortisol is gonna go up, and you're not gonna settle down. However, right. when we retrain our mind, when we learn how to put new information, and we're gonna talk quickly about it in a bit, okay. then my quick reaction, instead of being, oh my God, I'm gonna die, oh my God, there are miracles, mm. oh my God, there is hope, oh my God, what can I do if that's really bad, what can I do to make my life count? Okay, so this is where we form our new habits or try to implement the new work or behavior that we are trying to um, create for these new results that we want, right? Yes, yes, because there are scenarios in life. So let's go back to our subject as parents. Okay. My child did something really wrong. I'll jump in based on my subconscious mind and I start shouting if my parents didn't give me uh, the opportunity to talk. If my parents were controlling, I will be controlling and I cannot control my reaction. But if my parents were people that are really um, open-minded, they gave me the space to talk, instead of reacting to my child, I'm gonna say, come on, let's sit and talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think, I'm looking at the time, um, I think it would be very important to go next week into the next part of our conversation, going back, talking again about the mind, but how can we change our behavior? Oh, okay, well, that's perfect. I was gonna tell you that, okay, I thought you were gonna go into it for five minutes, but. No, no, we can, we can give quick, but okay. quick information, but if anyone has questions, if oh, anyone yeah, yeah. wants to ask something, we can answer that, and this way we can keep them excited to go back next week and listen to us. <laughs> okay let me check on instagram um i see lots of people but nobody's asking questions uh linkedin and, uh, and you know what yep question if people have the gut to ask the questions they have if they do have questions they really make much more sense to the conversation so we talk theory we talk stuff but if someone is dealing with a specific problem in their life this could help them so much so if we have a question, that's fine. If not, I'm going to give a scenario. 
<laughs> no, go ahead and give a scenario. Um, yep, nope, I don't see anybody on TikTok either, but thank you, King. <laughs> so I'll give an example of one of the stories I've been dealing with. So two parents who are really like they got married fairly uh, when they were at uh, maybe 40, uh, not not 40, let me calculate it, around their late 40s, yeah? And now they are in their late 60s dealing with a teenager who's 17. 17? Okay. 17. Now, okay. we talked, I think one of the times we need to also include to talk about this personality styles, that would be a really nice topic, and that would be maybe after two, after two uh, episodes. So, okay. with the disc personality styles, you have dominant, inspired, study, and compliant. These are the four. Yeah, the disc, not the, the disc. yeah, John Michael. with John Michael. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm a cert certified disc trainer, so yeah. um, we can John talk about. This. Yeah, you're saying dominant, dominant, influencer, study, influencer. and compliant. Study and compliant. Okay. Okay. Now the parents are in the study and compliant team, which is approximately 86% of the society. People who like routines, who like stuff to be done on time. Yeah, they want everything done as per the checklist. Now the son is a GI, yeah. which is a minority, <laughs> like it's 3% of the population. Wow. They hate conforming. They hate to be talked to with authority. Make up their own. And <laughs> they really want, like any teenager, they want their identity. They want, like, I'm 17. Like, it's time for me to give my opinion. They want but their because autonomy. The, yeah, but because the parents, the, the difference is that big in age, it's a different generation even. Mm -hmm. They cannot accept that personality style. And they keep on reacting in a way that they want to protect him because he's the only child. Mm. So what happens is they want to protect as a language of love. He loves his parents, but he wants to be. And he's getting frustrated. So guess what are his coping strategies? Vaping and speeding. Like speeding in the car or the drugs? Speeding in the car. Whew. So imagine when parents like that are trying to protect their kids from life, mm -hmm. they end up being the challenge to their kids and pushing their children to go towards the challenges that we, all, we are all esca escaping from. Mm. So this is... This is an example of how parents, by their love, and here we don't want to underestimate the pressure we go through as parents. We've all went through this, yeah. especially like my kids are 16, 17, and 19, yeah? Yeah. At the beginning when they were moving into a teenagehood, I was a bit like, oh my God, what can I do? I don't want my daughter to stay late because I want to sleep knowing that she's safe. But again, what are we doing by over controlling them and telling them not to do this, not to do that? They're going to run away. Yeah, they're, they're not going to be able to know how to make their own decisions. It's funny that you brought that up because my 21 year old, uh, I don't know how long ago this was, maybe six to six to eight months ago, she was vaping. And um, I didn't know she was. She was like, yeah, mom, I'm s totally stressed out. We just had a conversation one day and she's like, I'm trying to stop, but like, it feels like life is a lot right now. And I didn't judge her. I didn't say anything to her about it. I said, well, kiddo, I'm here to talk to you. If you, you know, you want to talk about it. She was like, yeah, mom, because I felt so shame. I didn't want to talk to it, talk to you about this. And I was just like, you can always come to me. And I think shortly after she had that conversation and we talked about that, she stopped vaping. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank yeah. you. 
I have goosebumps because this is what I really tell people about. If you just stand behind their door, smell, look at their cars and try to see if they are still vaping. If you're trying to control their behavior, this is not the, this is not how to solve the problem. Kids use vaping because they didn't find a place where they can put their pressure or where, where they can share what's going yeah. on in, with, in their life. When we as parents put our kids first, give them time and yes, I know the business deal would be $1 million worth of profits, yeah? But if your child gets addicted to vaping and they get that serious illness out of it, would the million dollar pay for them? Right. No. no, not at all. And, you know, I think we all she needed was for me to hold space for her as a parent and not be judgmental. Because uh, I think sometimes we forget as parents that we were them. We used to be that teenager. And also to like empathizing with gang. What what would I have wanted to do for the younger version of myself? Yeah. And I, I screwed up yesterday. I'll tell yeah. you, to be honest. Not I'll you. Tell you. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and my daughter is here sleeping. I hope, I hope she doesn't understand. She doesn't listen to me. <laughs> So, like, my my daughter, let's say, have this weakness of not waking up on time. Or if I'm there, it's me who's always trying to wake her up. If I'm not there, she does it. So I wasn't at home. And around 9.15, I was like, I want to check up on her just in case she didn't leave. I'll give her the opportunity to, to get ready and leave for work. But at the same time, I knew by doing that, I would be telling her, I don't trust you. Mm. My subconscious really went before my conscious. And I called. And the minute she answered, she was like, ah, so you don't trust me. Eee! So, you know, these are small things that we do as parents. For me, I wanted to protect her and not to be late at work and all of that. Yeah. But what am I communicating? Yeah. So as parents, we really love our children, but sometimes that love ruins our relationships rather than building them. Mm. So next well, week, we're going to give people some sort of tools and strategies to use to change their behavior. And if we have time, I'm going to talk about what I learned about motivation because while we're doing the behavioral change, what's going to happen is sometimes we lose the motivation and we go quickly back to the original behavior. So how we can sustain, sustain our behavior by using our motivation. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited because I can't wait to hear what the solutions are. <laughs> Well, if you guys want to find us, uh, Dima, she, you can see, you can find her on my social media. Um, and what's your website again, Dima? Is it uh, mindarchitecture.com? Mindarchitecture.com. Yep. Or Dima will be somewhere on social media. Sorry. You guys can <laughs> find me. <laughs> All right, yeah. everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>